Father Paul was an Orthodox monk who chose Mount Athos in Greece as the place to fulfill his passion for God and icons. Athos, 40 kilometers long and 12 kilometers wide. This unusual peninsula juts out into the Aegean Sea facing Turkey. Athos is a protectorate dating from the 9th century. An arrow and Byzantine princes gave up their fortunes so that the orthodox doctrine would not succumb to the spread of Islam. Silence because uh, I think it's like uh, every God's gift, uh, something from God is for me, not uh, something uh, human. <laughs> I am on Mount Athos for silence. I am a monk. I can live in Romania. I can live in uh, every country, but uh, uh, for silence is better in Mount Athos. Athos has been forbidden to women for the past 1,000 years. Today it is inhabited by 1,800 monks. Through their spirituality, the monks strive to be completely autonomous to such a degree that they refer to the world outside Athos as the cosmos. The monks submit to a demanding discipline of chastity, no material possessions, and obedience for total devotion to God. To benefit the community, each monk is assigned a task by a superior. The production of incense, as seen here, is in addition to other activities that are frequently interrupted by the incessant prayers. Even time must comply to the order of Athos. Respecting a Byzantine tradition, the monks do not follow the conventions of clocks and calendars. For them, it is always midnight when the sun sets. The St. Andreas Skitti. Its origins reach back to the 10th century. Its main church is the biggest in the Balkans, with the exception of the one in Sofia, Bulgaria. It is in its crypt that Father Paul attempts to resurrect icons. On the one side, we are a family of industrialists, and on the other side, a family of artists. My grandfather was a painter. We were a traditional family. What struck me since my childhood was not so much an artistic spirit, but more of a do-it-yourself spirit. I loved antiques. I would go to the flea market. I loved to look for things that I could buy for next to nothing and then, and then repair them. I loved to work with my hands. I liked the bohemian lifestyle and with the convictions that I had at the time, a monastic life meant I could combine the two, a desire for an alternative life and at the same time, a deep religious calling. An impressive patrimony. With the dawn of the 16th century came the end of artwork produced on wood in the Western Hemisphere, except in Greece, where the tradition continued. By the tens of thousands, works of art were created and ultimately destroyed. Today, Athos has 20,000 preserved works of art. Here, the restorer must be more than a simple artist or craftsman. 
he must be an historian and ultimately a theologian. This icon comes from the monastery at Iveron, which is one of the most important in Athos. It represents the Domission of the Virgin, that is, what happens at the death of the Virgin, who ascends to heaven, and it's very important to Christians. From an artistic and historical perspective, this is a 16th century icon, but the icon was repainted at the end of the 19th century. It therefore evokes a different message than that which was originally intended for the faithful. We are trying to restore it to its original state. It's our mission to give the true message back to believers. There are a lot of icons which are described as miraculous, that create miracles, but personally I believe that every icon is a miraculous object, because every icon evokes prayer. The miracle is the approach of the divine towards us. Therefore, icons are objects which facilitate communication with the divine. So that the icons may communicate the history of centuries past, a small fraternity has grown up around them. Father Paul is the Igomen, the father superior of the Skitti. He guides the renaissance of the sacred objects. This is achieved by consolidating the wood, encrusting the resin, adhering the paint, and touching up the paintings. The different stages require surgical attention and precision. The Greek restoration workshops are revered throughout the world. Students who come here have the privilege of working on the sacred heritage of the Orthodox religion. To the rhythm of the seasons, Mount Athos exudes its spirituality. The monks refer to their monastic life here as the University of the Desert. I believe this Kiti is really the land of my dreams. It's the ideal place. Yet unfortunately, in many places the Skitti is a pile of ruins and crumbling walls. Dilapidated structures litter the area. It is but a shadow of the once gigantic monastery, so palatial that it was baptized the Surreal, a compound that measured 22,000 square meters and counted some 600 monks. The monastery owed its grandeur to Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia and an apostle of the Orthodox religion. The fall of the Tsar signaled the death toll for the St. Andreas Monastery. The revolution of 1917 opened the door to Bolshevism. Russian proclivity for the Orthodox religion came to an abrupt halt. Its importance dwindled, as did funding. Three thousand kilometers away, Mount Athos was forgotten. The monks abandoned the St. Andreas Skitti for the revolution in Russia. They never returned. On Mount Athos, time came to a halt. The silence that had once been a part of the meantime ritual was now permanent in the cavernous refectory. Only a handful of monks attempted to maintain the prayers in the abandoned Surreal. In 1958, the last occupants were confronted with a new challenge a fire that ravaged any hope for the monastery's survival. This is the building which housed the library of the Skiti, which had almost 20,000 books, among them some very precious Byzantinian manuscripts. So the fire practically sounded the death knell for the Skiti, because afterwards the two monks who lived here abandoned the Skiti. Ever since, nobody touched anything here. So when I arrived at the Skiti six years ago, I found it in a shocking state. This area is called the hell of the Skiti. When I first entered the courtyard here, I felt 
a challenge. Bit by bit, I tried to reconstruct a modest life here. All of the infrastructure, the water, the electricity, was destroyed, and I had to recreate a part of the reservoir, which was the ancient water supply. I had to try to bring a new life to this place, so the Skiti would reopen its doors. Among the visitors, I found helpers and collaborators, people who came with a spirit of solidarity and who put their skills, small or large, to use. French, Albanian, Romanian, Greek, the nationalities multiplied, build and rebuild. United in their faith, their mission became universal. Religious pilgrims, inspired craftsmen, travelers in search of spirituality, they all came to revive the Skiti. There was practically no money, but the enthusiasm of Father Paul reached beyond Mount Athos. Meager donations allowed him to survive. Cleared, plowed, and enriched, the fields are planted with vegetables to nourish the monks. The vines are replanted. Nowadays, some of the grapes are harvested. And yet, it is a far cry from the bountiful vineyard that was once renowned among the monasteries. The fine wine that was once produced here enjoyed a widespread reputation. Little remains of the prestigious wine cellar from that golden era. By his restoration, Father Paul honors the past. The skitty must return to a daily life on par with its glorious history. The custodian of this historic and solitary treasure, Father Paul was ultimately joined by his own father and his brother. The first to arrive was his brother, who also became a monk before assisting his sibling. They were joined by their father, who became a monk upon uniting with his sons. It was through her love of God that their mother came to accept the situation. The father became Father Andreas. He welcomed the pilgrims who benefited from the legendary hospitality of the monks. Some of the pilgrims make the trip to visit the tomb of a particular monk. Here they are at home. Their room and board is a gift of the monastery. But the length of the visitor's stay on Mount Athos is determined by the religious authorities. Tirelessly and always with enthusiasm, Father Andreas keeps open the doors of the main church. Unlike the twelve other churches in the Skitti, the main church miraculously escaped damage during the violent past. It quietly suffers the ravages of time. The Iconostasis. This partition which separates the nave from the sanctuary reflects the Byzantine riches. At his feet is the reliquary of the Apostle Andreas, the brother of Peter. He was crucified head down in Greece. A part of his skull preserved here still commands deep respect and homage. Further along is one of the numerous representations of the Virgin. This painting from the late 19th century tells the story of Father Andreas. 
It is so perfect that it captivates those who observe it. A sort of Mona Lisa of Mount Athos. It's, it's not only the eyes. It's the, the, the whole icon turns to the place you are going. Also the, the chair. Not only the, the eyes of Mother and uh, Christ. The history of this peninsula, accessible only by sea, remains a mystery. Legend has it that the Virgin, accompanied by John, rested here after weathering a violent storm. This peaceful place became a garden of the Virgin. The early Orthodox priests came here starting in the 7th century. The famous precursor was the hermit Atanasi, who cleared the cave to join in communion with the Holy Virgin. Later, he established the foundations of the first monastery on Mount Athos. It was called the Grand Lavra. It is the year 963, a time when Mount Athos would assume enormous importance. This veritable Orthodox state within Greece is accessible only with a visa. Its government is seated at the capital city of Caries. It consists of 20 elected members who congregate twice a year to manage the spiritual community. 20 members represent the 20 monasteries of Athos. Each monastery remains autonomous. Regardless of whether it is Russian, Bulgarian, Greek or Serbian, the monastery constitutes a territory upon which sit secondary monasteries called skitties. There are also farms called kelias and temples of total isolation called ermitages. The St. Andreas Skitty is situated on the northeast part of the peninsula. Although resolutely focused on the future, Father Paul does value the monastery's grand past. It was an era when the monks balanced spirituality with modernism. For example, they were among the first to believe in the virtues of photography. This used to be the monastery's photography studio. It was a very important place at the time because for different events, the religious authorities from the Skiti, or even Athos, came here to be photographed. So that's why you can see this backdrop with representations of the Skiti, Mount Athos, the summit, and on top, the little cloud that is always there, like a hat on Mount Athos. More than 3,000 photos remain from the end of the 19th century and the beginning of this century. We once had almost 2,000 glass plates, now less than half remain. It was a vibrant record of the social life of the epoch. This is a... Here is the workroom, or the darkroom. I should say that the first development laboratory at the Skiti dates back to 1865, so that at the time, it was the first darkroom in Greece. Miraculously preserved, objects and packaging from that period bear the signature of the Lumiere brothers. These are the real beginnings of photography. Here inside, we can see the darkroom. Off to the right inside, behind the red stained glass, that's where they develop the photos. Here is a frame that they used, well, they used to get a round image. During his pilgrimage to Athos, a young Frenchman named Stéphane volunteered to take over the photo archives. 
Nous avons entre 300 et 400 photos. We have between 300 and 400 photos here at the Skitty. I digitalize them, scan them, and then put them onto a CD-ROM. That allows us first to file them and then have quick access because the less we touch the glass plates, the better. I'm going to show you some now. This one, for example, has a charming detail. Here you can see that he's holding a photo in his hand. When it's enlarged, just to the side, it is he, only younger, before he became a priest during his military service in Russia. I'm going to show you a photo of a dead body, a priest. It's quite moving already. Then one can see when it's scanned and enlarged, certain areas have been touched up. White hairs added to the beard, the mustache, and the head. I think those are the kind of things you can't find with the naked eye. A historian is going to come to the Skitty. He's going to be able to give us some guidance to direct us a little bit. In the meantime, Father Paul continues his mission. Restore the multitude of icons found in this open-air museum of Mount Athos. On this particular day, he is bringing an icon to the Evangelista Skitti. The icon was restored by students. Here, as in other monasteries, the tradition of sacred art from the Byzantine period is perpetuated. Whether they were painters or sculptors, the monks received no formal art training. It was through experience and the learned advice of their elders that the monks were able to produce the art of their ancestors. For Father Paul, the work is completed. The restoration of one icon can take several days, even several months, depending upon the state of disrepair. The restorer must always invest much time and energy to his work, for which he is rarely financially compensated. For the most part, the monasteries don't have the means to finance repair work, which basically compels us to work for nothing. Which is to say, we do what is necessary to save the icons, and in exchange, the monasteries occasionally give us produce, sometimes wine or fruit. It depends. To fully appreciate his visit, Father Paul lingers in one of the oldest chapels on Mount Athos. Here, the oldest and the most recent icons cohabit in harmony. Do you see this iconostasi? It's one of the oldest preserved on Mount Athos. The icons, which are framed, date from the end of the 16th century. The lower part is made of contemporary icons which were painted here on Mount Athos by the iconographers, by the monks. Now this iconostas is restored. These objects, the iconostases, these icons are living objects which, with use, attain a spiritual function. The monks use them for prayer. And for that reason, we have to continue the tradition of creating the icons, using the same methods and using the same materials which have been used for centuries. To recreate the techniques used by his predecessors, Father Maximus uses sophisticated technology. X-ray photography reveals the history of certain icons. The examination of the works of art with X-rays help us to investigate and explore and discover other paint layers under the visible one, just like in this case of the particular icon. The visible image belongs to the 19th century, while the original one, the, the one that was discovered with the X-rays, belongs to the 16th century. In the visible image, we see the eyes of the Virgin Mary and the head of the Christ, while in the radiogram, the eyes are recorded of the Virgin Mary in this area and the head also. In the visible image, the eyes of the Virgin Mary is depicted are recorded in this area. The same for the head of the Jesus of the visible image are recorded here and 
the head of the original is recorded in this area very clearly. Along with his brother Paul, Father Maximus has taken on another task, to bring the archives back to life. Among this debris, which has been scattered over time, they will undoubtedly identify many treasures. What we first did is to save them because they are on the floors of the various departments of the Skiti. And uh, what we first did is to save them from the water, from the humidity. And then we'll, uh, little by little, we'll start uh, in the investigation, reading and put them in uh, better order. Father Maximus preferred to put his elite engineering education to use in the Skiti, rather than by taking over his family's business. Like the other monks of Athos, he has given up all material possessions to devote himself entirely to God. This sacrifice does not exclude, however, an active life in the monastic community. Deciphering the archives figures among the monastery's principal activities. We have more than 500 envelopes of this size, and uh, we have put them in order according to the year of uh, the documents they were written. Many of them are letters. The letter is written for the igumen of uh, the Skiti, the abbot Arch Archimandrite Theodoritus. All this paper, together with all the documents here in this library, describe the uh, daily life of the old monks, so we can uh, understand their life, how their services, their program, and their relations with the other monasteries. We can try to, uh, to understand all the story of the Skiti. And this is the re for this reason, all the documents are very important for us, and very important for the history not only of the Skiti, but the history of all the Mount Athos. In the neighboring building, a hospital and a pharmacy built a century ago await restoration. Here we're in the pharmacy, in the famous pharmacy of the Skiti of St. Andreas, which was at the time the center of all medical and all pharmaceutical science on Mount Athos. At the time, Mount Athos had a population of nearly 7,000 monks. It was a place where they could combine the modern science of the era and a tradition which dated back a thousand years. At that time, Mount Athos was a world unto itself, independent of the world beyond its shores. Medicine came essentially from plant extracts. The peninsula's lush vegetation consisted of 1,000 different species, of which some were endemic. And you see, with traditional medicine, they used all sorts of plants. The monks themselves prepared the different medicines in the bottles, and they also made capsules. So we can see that there was a complete production of medicines and different preparations. Here are the dozens of drawers where the plants were organized and stored. The instant that I entered this place, I, I was so stunned that I, I took a pencil and I came over here against the wall and I wrote the date, 1990, when for the first time I saw this, I saw this place. And that's the date when I decided on the project to save this place. But I'm disappointed to tell you that now, well, now we're almost at the year 2000 and we've done next to nothing.
You see, it's very important to study all of this, to record all that is left in order to restore a bit of the science of the time. Tradition. The knowledge transferred from one generation of monks to another determines the organization of daily life on Mount Athos. To bread, oil, olives and vegetables, honey is added for a frugal menu that excludes meat. Bees also provide the wax that is necessary for making candles. The monks here on Mount Athos try to spend eight hours a day in prayer. Here we say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, or Holy Mother of God, save us. So when the faithful have a rosary, they say their beads. This is an activity that allows for the concentration necessary for the work of a monk. All the monks have this kind of rosary. It's a tradition that comes from the third century. The human spirit can find it difficult to stay in prayer constantly. So this object, the beads, is a sacred gift of God to help us achieve constant prayer. Our first obligation is to be a living icon of Christ. First of all, icons are living things. That is why the graphically presented icons have miraculous powers, because the saint, Christ, or the Virgin Mary are truly present. We can pray to them, and they really help us. Legend has it that the first icons found on Mount Athos washed ashore after having been thrown into the sea by their owners, hoping to save them from capture by the infidels. There is also talk of certain icons that were not made by man, but rather are of divine origin. In this airplane, flying Father Paul to Paris, are icons of another nature that he must evaluate. Accompanied by the photographer Carlos Freire, he will visit the Petit Palais. At this museum, he hopes to discover a superb treasure in the form of an exceptional icon collection donated to the city of Paris by a wealthy collector. Gilles Chazal, the museum director, plans to exhibit the 83 Russian icons with the help of Father Paul's invaluable expertise. In preparation for this remarkable presentation, the curator, Marie-Christine Boucher, offers a behind-the-scene look at the treasures of the Petit Palais among the most prestigious works of art, which are located in a specifically prepared room, are the icons. This is sublime. This is a true icon. It's the virgin traditionally called Relicophilus, she who kisses Christ. We It is a very, very beautiful painting. That is the art of the 17th century from Corfu. In the composition, there are elements introduced by Western art of the time. One can see certain parts which are in the Byzantinian style and others which follow a Western style. But you do things that I wouldn't dare do, that I certainly wouldn't let anyone else do. 
You can touch the icons. It's the privilege of the artist and the restorer. Me, I believe the icons are made to evoke devotion, the love of humanity. So we touch icons, we kiss them. That gives them life. That's true, but as a museum curator, I have a body of work to preserve, such as it is. Even I don't dare to touch them. <laughs> you have to dare. Winter is harsh on Mount Athos, and this desolate period of the year is most conducive to deep contemplation and meditation. There are times when I feel very tired, totally abandoned by humans and also by God. But that only serves to encourage the inquiry. It is not the body that is dominant, it is the spirit that dominates the body. The winter is the time when it's really, really difficult place to live because your needs increase. It's cold, there's no light. You feel alone, there aren't visitors. Near the cemetery is a sort of chapel which holds the bones of the deceased. It is the ossuary, a place for communion with the souls of the departed. This is a very important place in the life of every monastery because in the Orthodox tradition we show a particular respect for relics, for bones. Three years after burial, bodies are exhumed and the bones are brought here. The skulls and skeletons are purified before being placed in the ossuary. Only the skulls are arranged chronologically. Death does not eliminate the person. So we keep our respect for all the qualities that a person had in their life. We attribute sanctity to all these skulls and bones because though God will finally judge, for us, they're still human beings, those who did what they had to do. So we have to render the necessary respect. Each skull is identified and marked with the name of the monk in Chinese ink. The inscription also includes the monk's ministry and the date that he entered the monastery, otherwise known as his spiritual birth. All this is to ensure that he is not forgotten. In this cupboard are kept all the skulls of the Igumen, or the holy men of the Skiti. There are nine skulls here. That's a short period of life in the Skiti. One can see that in this cupboard they have put a blue glaze on two sides, which symbolizes eternity. These holy men did well and lived as they must. Now they are close to the throne of God. Only one day brightens the sober winter season. It is the feast day of St. Andreas, the patron saint of the Skitty. The celebration is organized for the religious authorities of Mount Athos, as well as other monks who come to honor the saint. For this occasion, the church, which was built in 1900, must display all its splendor. Alleluia. 
ఉపవిధేశం అప్పుడు యాదవులు నిజకులు చిన్నప్పటి సమయాన్ని మీ అనాస్త కిరేశ్వర మొదటి సేపు ఆటోక్ష పార్వశేఖరం రాజ్ మాతేవ chants begin at noon and last for 12 full hours from dusk until dawn they echo the homage paid to saint andreas then prepared some monks from the area cook the meal using a fish base this is a luxury compared with the usual fare the monks eat in silence while sacred texts are read The meal lasts barely 15 minutes. Father Paul responds to yet another request for help regarding the icons. He is summoned by the Stavronikita monastery, which was built upon the sea nearly 1000 years ago. At his side is Robert Bougrain du Bourg, the creator of Restores Without Borders. He is an avid supporter of Father Paul's. Today, he is evaluating an exceptional fresco done by the Cretan school. Time has taken a heavy toll on the painted mural. Badly damaged, it must be repaired or rather revived. Before any work is done, an initial sample must be taken. This indicates the appropriate treatment for the painting. We have to study the quality of this painting. because we can see a bit throughout where there's a gray background with white traces then they recover it with a glaze to give the final impression of blue it's more than an impression you could say it's almost like lapis lazuli it's incredible the sample will be analyzed at the art school of avignon in france on the photo it's perhaps not the same thing if you look at this slice there's a fine layer of blue on the surface and underneath there's a thicker layer the sophisticated technology so badly lacking at mount athos is available here it is graciously put at the disposal of father paul the objective is to select the segment which is going to give us the most information We try to see the number of layers, their thickness in comparison with one and the other, their state of deterioration. A whole lot of elements which could help understand the technique of the painting and help with the restoration or conservation. Nous on compare les échantillons avec des standards. Alors voilà la réponse de l'appareil. The Faculty of Science at Avignon also participates in Father Paul's noble cause. Organic chemistry improves the efficiency of the intervention made at Mount Athos. The art school of Avignon is unique in its field. 
In addition to specializing in painting, the school is the only one to train students who will work outside of Europe. Well, I'm lifting all the alterations off of a painting. It's a painting from 17th century Cambodia. We lift off all the alterations. Well, that's very interesting. Here, Father Paul has a stable of future technicians capable of restoring the icons. Each year, only six of them will obtain a degree that permits them to work in the field of restoration. During their five years of study, they will travel to Egypt, Thailand, Eastern Europe and other destinations. Because women are forbidden entry to Mount Athos, Father Paul has no female students. He tends to direct them towards study in Turkey. We're going to restructure it and then give it a coat of varnish so we can start the retouching. It's really lovely, this painting. Where does it come from? It comes from a church in Bolen. You say that the knowledge is in the process of being lost because of the need for efficiency. Yes. At the moment, 85% of the iconographers in Greece use acrylic. To save icons, Father Paul organizes international conferences and is an active fundraiser. Father Paul is a passionate advocate of this little-known art. As Providence would have it, Father Paul's message is finally being heard beyond Mount Athos. Just a few cable lengths from Istanbul, the Orthodox congregation has preserved a monastery with the tolerance of the Turkish authorities. It is here that teachers and students participate in restoration workshops. At the summit of Hay Bailey Island sits a monastery that is accessible only by foot or horse-drawn wagon. While the tourists swarm to see the exceptional site, a few monks toil at preserving their orthodox identity. Father Paul has set up his workshop in the principal church at the heart of the monastery. He began with the restoration of icons dating from the end of the 17th century. Hence, the students had the immense privilege of working with icons that they would have never have been able to touch otherwise. While religious services are celebrated in the church, Father Paul performs painstaking autopsies on the icons. We can remark the presence of this protective coat that the painter intentionally applied on the top of the new made paint film in order to protect it till the icon is completely dry and it needed rather one year. So during that time, they used to put a protective coat from uh, oils or egg uh, glares. And when restored, it is practically insoluble in any organic solvent. If we decide to remove it, uh, go on with the mechanical means. A last supper is shared with the students. It provides an opportunity to remind them that they have chosen an exceptional trade. I hope that next year we will be able to do something with the same uh, love and the same um, uh, attachment to that aim, which is a, a real a holy aim, in general speaking, because it is for the good of the whole humanity and uh, to save the planet uh, patrimony. Return to Mount Athos. In a crypt that has been transformed into a workshop, Father Paul rejoins his faithful collaborators, 
whom he says have been sent him by God. Restorations of icons in particular demands a certain devotion to icons. Not strictly in the religious sense. There is no need to be a monk or practicing Orthodox Christian, but your soul must be open to the divine, to the invisible world. When you want to achieve a real creation, a perfection, you must have patience, and that patience is the result of the love that you have for the object. God gave me the talent to restore, to save these holy icons. I have the impression that the moment of death will come when I finish this work. At that point, God will be truly happy with the work that I have done for these holy icons.